42. Regeneration The problem of personal and social renewal is the most persistent problem of civilization. Again and again, as one culture has succeeded another, each with vigor and promise offering man hope for a stable, happy and growing society, disillusionment has set in. Sin and frustration erode the cultural hope, and men turn on their society and rend it asunder. Sometimes, before the end comes, many flee to the hills and deserts or abandon the established forms of society in protest, because man has found his greatest obstacle to be man himself. The decline of both Greece and Rome saw the rise of ascetics and nonconformists, and the decline of Christendom in the 14th century meant the rise of disaffiliates, men whose essential position was dissent from and war against the established order. In the 19th and 20th centuries, bohemians of the various schools of arts, nihilists, beatniks and hippies are only a few of the many disillusioned groups who protest against existing society. For some, the hope lies in revolution. Somehow, revolution will create regeneration. The roots of this faith are deep in the old chaos cults, in the belief in the energizing and fertilizing power of chaos, and that personal and social regeneration requires the chaos of revolution. This hope, however, has always been very bitterly disillusioning, in that revolution not only destroys the hopes of its believers, but also is normally a force of reaction and greatly aggravates the evils it is supposed to eliminate. The result of revolution is that man is more deeply marred in the morass he sought to escape from. The various religious and political efforts to escape from the burden of sin and guilt and find personal and social renewal alike end in disaster. Not surprisingly, a recurring factor in human thought has been the despair of man and history. When man loses faith in the future of man, and when he despairs of any meaning in history, then his hope becomes severely localized in terms of the present and the available, and his life becomes trivialized. Civilization gives way to trivialization. Man's concern then becomes social status, the right kinds of food and wines, in brief, taste refined to a religion, and nothing irritates him more than other people. Man can then neither live with or without other people, and his life is a long complaint over their presence as well as their absence. In the UNESCO, we find this kind of mood expressed realistically and with humour. Quote, My contemporaries irritate me. I detest the neighbour to my right. I detest the neighbour to my left. Above all, I detest the one on the floor above me. Just as much anyway as the one on the ground floor. Say, I love on the ground floor myself. Everyone is wrong. I envy people whose contemporaries were alive two centuries ago. No, they are still too close to us. I can be indulged only to those who lived well before Jesus Christ. And yet, when my contemporaries die, I feel terribly distressed. Distressed? Afraid, rather? Tremendously frightened? That is understandable. I feel more and more alone. How can I manage without them? What am I going to do living on with all... The others? Why is it the others did not die instead of them? I wish I could make the decision myself and choose those who should remain. End quote. Such an attitude leads also to self-hate. However, because trivialization has conquered and because man has rejected ultimate meaning in favour of purely existential interests, the self-hate is also trivial. A man or woman looks into the mirror and does not say, I am a sinner and I need to submit to God's word and meaning and I need to relate my daily concern with ultimate meaning and purpose or else my life becomes meaningless and trivial. Rather, the look into the mirror is a trivial surface look. My hair doesn't set right. My skin looks bad or age lines are beginning to show. Will clothes make the right impression or will I look as poorly as I feel? Men hate themselves for trifling reasons, and they adore themselves for ungodly reasons. Despair with respect to history leads to a flight from history and meaning, and an absorption with the moment. 
The roots of that flight are in sin. Man despairs over history because it fails to yield him his desired meaning and he will not accept God's. Like the rich fool, Luke 12, 13-21, he makes the world equal no more than his interests. When men and cultures fail, they long for an opportunity to start over again. They rebel against an empty maturity in favour of a new start. Since they cannot become young again, they seek to destroy the forms of age. The old dress like the young and childlessly seek to recapture the freshness and opportunity of youth. Culturally, this means a turning away from the established and mature norms to a worship of primitivism. As Baird observed, quote, Cultural failure accelerates primitivism, whatever the type, end quote. The myth of the noble savage predominates, and the more backward a people, the more they are idealized and romanticized. Quote, Authentic primitivism is a mode of sentence, a creed springing inevitably from a state of cultural failure. It represents one attempt of Western man to restore the symbolism of human existence. End quote. The paintings of Paul Gauguin, prior to his departure for Tahiti, show a greater mastery of technique in gold and are superior to his later works, but they are clearly not so regarded by the world of art. The reason is religious. Gauguin was, quote, as though he had grimly determined to compel Tahiti into paradise, end quote. He spoke of Tahitian woman as, quote, not beautiful, properly speaking, end quote, but as having an indefinable quality, quote, of penetrating the mysteries of the infinite, end quote. Those who delight in Gauguin's Tahitian paintings are men who share in Gauguin's yearning for the primitive and his hope of a new beginning through primitive man. Such men, like their culture, die sick, diseased and lonely. The self-conscious primitivist not only corrupts what good he may already possess, but also those whom he idealizes. The primitivist is not interested in the African, the American Indian, the Negro or the Polynesian, but in himself. He is afraid of death and judgment, and seeks a non-theistic regeneration in, quote, primitive, end quote, man's ways and culture. He uses the, quote, unquote, primitive man for his own purposes with a radical callousness, both culturally and personally. Thus, Pablo Picasso regularly stole his son's clothing to wear it himself and thereby steal his son's youth. The boy's mother commented, quote, I finally became convinced that Pablo hoped by this method that some of Claude's youth would enter into his own body. It was a metaphorical way of appropriating someone else's substance, and in that way, I believe, he hoped to prolong his own life. End quote. This kind of primitivism marks not a new beginning, but a certain end. It is a sign of approaching cultural and intellectual death. Others, also aware of the cultural crisis, seek renewal by means of a rigorous legalism. Their hope is that a highly disciplined law order can bring about social renewal. Clearly, law is important, but in and of itself, it can accomplish nothing. Some of the strictest laws of the Western world have been passed in the last century, and man's decline into lawlessness has not been checked thereby. Severe laws against pornography did not check its spread and proliferation. The place of law in society cannot be usurped by love or psychotherapy, but neither can law replace grace and regeneration. Law can never regenerate society. It can greatly develop and further a society of regenerate man and is essential to growth. But before growth can begin, there must be life, and this the law cannot provide. Moreover, when a society is declining into pessimism and doubt with respect to the future, it has far more faith in primitivism than in law. Law suggests discipline and tradition, whereas a dying world wants the antithesis of order. It wants the raw blood of birth. It is thus drawn to primitivism. The appeal of primitivism is in part the belief that, quote, primitive, end quote, man is somehow before and beyond the law. He is outside the world of culture and its problems. Supposedly, the, quote, primitive, end quote, man lives and dies without any effete and civilized self-consciousness, 
as a child of nature. To return to that world before history means to return to the world before church, state, family and religion, a world before morality. This means in the myth about, quote, primitive, end quote, man, a return to the world of the orgy. Modern pornography is an attempt to re-establish the, quote, free, end quote, world of the orgy and to abolish the world of law and morality. Its basic function is rebirth by means of the systematic abandonment of all known scruples and laws of every society in recorded history with respect to sex. By means of this total plunge into sexual chaos, man will supposedly find freedom and society a new birth. The appeal of pornography is to a large measure religious. People who are disillusioned with religion and society are anxious to escape the inexorable workings of a law universe, hope by pornography to step back into and recreate a timeless world of sexual ecstasy and regeneration. The great myth of all pornography is the dream of cosmic coition, the sex act which brings mystical release from the past and a blinding, soaring bliss to the initiate. Ernest Hemingway's Insane, For Whom the Bell Tolls, 1940, gives us this magical sex, and it is a telling bit of evidence of the extent of the belief in salvation by the act of cosmic coition that so few laughed at the book. The earth is portrayed as moving, quote, out and away from under, end quote, a copulating couple as they are born again in this magical sexual act. Pornography is turgid and poor writing and tiresome and difficult reading. It is the mystical and religious aspect of its nature which draws its devotees, just as the tasteless and absurd obscenities of perverse sexuality draw people who hope that by their violation of moral law they have also breached the claims of life, death and God against them. Whether by mysticism or by pornography or by any other means, Man does not escape God, nor does he escape time and history. Salvation eludes him as long as he seeks to elude God. All his efforts at insinuating a regeneration by man or by the state end up in failure. This failure was very much present in the mind of Nicodemus, quote, a man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews, end quote, John 3.1. Nicodemus lived in an era that was very much aware of these issues. Greece, Rome and Judea were alike concerned over social and personal regeneration. Greek culture was well known to all in Judea and Koine, a form of Greek, was their second language. The coinage of the Roman Empire carried the language in hope of regeneration. Not too long before Nicodemus, Virgil, 70-19 70-19 BC had expressed this common hope in the emperor as the regenerator in his fourth eclogue, declaring in part, quote, Now is come the last stage of the command prophecy. The great cycle of periods is born anew. Now from high heaven a new generation comes down. Yet do thou at thy boy's birth, in whom the iron race shall begin to cease, and the golden to arise over all the world, holy Lucina, be gracious, now thine own Apollo reigns, and in thy consulate, in thine, O Polio, shall this glorious age enter, and the great months begin their march. Under thy rule what traces of our guilt yet remain, vanishing shall free earth for ever from alarm. He shall grow in the life of gods, and shall see gods and heroes mingled, and himself be seen by them and shall rule the world that his father's virtues have set at peace. But on thee, O boy, untilled shall earth first pour childish gifts, wandering ivy tendrils and foxglove, and colocasia mingled with the laughing acanthus. Untended shall the she-goats bring home their milks won't udders, nor shall huge lions alarm the herds. Unbidden thy cradle shall break into wooing blossom, the snake too shall die, and die the treacherous poison plant. A Syrian spice shall grow all up and down. End quote. Augustus saw himself as the fulfilment of this prophecy of world renewal. In Stauffer's vivid words, quote, Augustus took his prophet at his word. 
He gave official sanction and fulfilment to the politicizing of the ancient hope of a saviour. In the year 17 BC, when a strange star shone in the heavens, he saw that the cosmic hour had come and inaugurated a 12-day Advent celebration, which was a plain proclamation of Virgil's message of joy. Quote, the turning point of the ages has come, end quote. From documents known of old, as well as from some which have recently been discovered, from historians, poets, inscriptions, monuments and coins, we have more reliable information about these days and their official significance than of almost any other happening of ancient history. Heralds traversed Italy with their star-studded shields and the blessed wand of Hermes and announced the invitation to the ceremonies. The Roman College of Priests, with Augustus himself at their head, distributed holy incense to the masses for purification from past guilt. The people bought the fruits of the land for sacrifices to the chief gods of the festival, Apollo and Diana. The emperor inaugurated the ceremonies in the nights preceding June the 1st, a night of full moon. As divine and human mediator between heaven and earth and the high priest of the Roman people, the emperor approached the altar in order to make a blood offering to the goddesses of fate with the prayer. I beseech you to grant the Roman people perpetual invulnerability, victory and prosperity, and be ever gracious to me and my house. End quote. By the time of Nicodemus, the hopes of Augustus for world regeneration had died with him, and the new mood was cynicism and contempt. For Nicodemus, as a Pharisee, there was already a radical disbelief in all the pagan efforts at regeneration, as well as despair, as a ruler of the people, over the prospects in Judea and Galilee. The administration of the law had kept neither Pharisees nor Sadducees from corruption, and the common people had only a formal regard for the law, especially the Galileans. Nicodemus approached Jesus with two opinions clearly in mind. First, as he told Jesus, quote, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. John 3, 2. Nicodemus knew that God had, every few centuries, sent prophets and leaders to his people, and that these men had manifested God's power in miracles. Here, clearly, was another such man. Nicodemus, we know, was a discreet veiling of the reality of his opinion, quote, I know, end quote. Second, the futility of history was only aggravated by these periodical appearances because history did not seem to be altered nor regeneration to follow. The kingdom of God was plainly the religious goal of history. How was it to be obtained? The quest to Nicodemus seemed futile. How could men attain that kingdom? Quote, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3. This was clearly the solution, to be born anew. Regeneration? Nicodemus recognized both its necessity and its impossibility. Quote, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? John 3.4 because Nicodemus was a ruler and a religious leader, he was sharply aware of the problem. How can mature men change their lives and directions short of being born again, each from his mother's womb? Any realistic look at men, even in Christian circles, indicates how greatly the old ways still prevail within us, so that at times a sight of Christian nature is far from encouraging. For Nicodemus, the problem was a grim one. He wanted a regenerated person and society, and, short of being born afresh from one's mother's womb with a full knowledge of past sins and the power to be a new creature, how could a man avoid the disheartening cycle of sin and decay? When Augustus, with all his power, could not alter the oppressive cycle of birth, sin and despairing death, how could any man do more? Was not all history evidence of the hopelessness of the quest? Was there anything more possible beyond that which the Pharisees hoped for, the yoke of the law to keep men in check? Quote, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, 
he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. John 3, 5 to 8. Man's rebirth must be, Jesus said, by water, symbolizing purification, and spirit, symbolizing quickening or making alive. The words, quote, carry back the thoughts of hearer and reader to the narrative of creation, Genesis 1-2, and to the characteristics of natural birth, to which St. John has already emphatically referred, 1-13, end quote. More specifically, as Westcott pointed out further, quote, the water and the Spirit suggest the original shaping of the great order out of chaos when the Spirit of God brooded on the face of the waters, and at the same time this new birth is distinctly separated from the corruptible element, blood, which symbolizes that which is perishable and transitory in human life. End quote. Man is related to two spheres of being, one called quote unquote, flesh, that which is born of Adam, and the other called quote, spirit, end quote, that which is born of God, John 3, 6. He must be born again of the Spirit of God, made a new creation by him. Jesus did not say, quote, we must be born again, end quote, but ye must be born again, verse 7, exempting himself as the creator. Just as the wind is real and yet unseen except in its effects, so is the man who is born of the Spirit, quote, Notice that it is not the spirit, but the man born of the spirit who has the wind's mysterious character. End quote. The wind is an outside force which acts upon trees and waters. So too the regenerate man is an outside force to the degree that he is in Christ and obedient to his law word. There is thus far more to history than history. There are regenerate men and supremely the regenerating and sovereign God. When men view history only in terms of history, their only recourse is to despair. Nicodemus's problem was that he saw no factor as determinative in history, save that which was born of history. Quote, the Jewish rabbis were not expecting anything new. End quote. As a result, Nicodemus could visualize nothing new. He was, as of that moment, yet without faith. Faith, however, establishes men in a new kind of knowledge and power. As Machen noted, quote, Far from being contrasted with knowledge, faith is founded upon knowledge. End quote. Moreover, quote, quote, unquote, Faith, the author of Hebrews says, quote, is the substance of things hoped for. End quote. The word here translated substance is translated in the American Revised Version, assurance. But the difference is not important. The point in either case is that by faith, future events are made to be certain. The old translation merely puts the thing a little more strongly. Future events, it means, become through faith so certain that it, as though they had already taken place, the things that are promised to us become, by our faith in the promise, so certain that it is as though we had the very substance of them in our hands here and now. In either case, whether the correct translation be substance or assurance, faith is here regarded as providing information about future events. It is presented as a way of predicting the future. End quote. Faith is a witness to the fact of regeneration and its goal. Regeneration, palingenesia, in the Greek, palin, again, Genesis birth, is both personal and cosmic. In Matthew 19.28, regeneration is clearly cosmic. In Titus 3.5, it is personal. Quote, According to his mercy, he saved us by the washing, or labor, of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Compare John 1.12, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Ephesians 4.22-24, James 1.18, 1 Peter 1.23, 1 John 3.1-3, 5.1. All too often, men are discouraged as they view history by the fact of judgment and decay. 
They see an unregenerate world and are unwilling to see it perish. The presence of decay and death and every grim reminder of judgment, instead of encouraging them with respect to the certainty of God's government and triumph, disheartens them. Like Lot, they grieve too much for Sodom. Regeneration requires that the old man and the old world perish, so that the new may be born. Regeneration occurs within history, but its origin and determination is from God.